number 21. Now I'd like to consider this little portion, but as our Lord implies, setting before us in simple picture form, the appeal of the gospel. As we read in John chapter three, as the son of man was lift, uh, sorry, as the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up, so the son of man must likewise be lifted up. Uh, that he would suffer and die on a cross, but as the antidote for sin, uh, as the way that sinners may be saved from their sin, that all of us may find, and the only way that any person may find refuge and antidote, an antidote for their sin. And I believe we have in this simple narrative, in one sense, a universal picture of mankind and the situation we find ourselves in with our sin uh, and the simple way of salvation. Uh, it is the last miracle that Moses would do if you could say that he did it, but under the instruction of the Lord uh, and wonderfully gracious miracle. From now on, the Israelites will see uh, victories, victory after victory after victory, uh, and entering the promised land, whereas before much has been defeat, rebellion, difficulties, uh, but now after this wonderful victories. Uh, it is near the end of the 40 years they have been in the wilderness, and they are drawing near to the promised land, ready to enter the promised land. But they are not allowed to go through the land of Edom, not because they are unwilling, not because the Lord said they cannot, but because the king of Edom will not let them. Verse 14 in chapter 20. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh, unto the king of Edom, thus saith thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers uh, went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, uh, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And then verse 17, let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country, we will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells, we will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. Essentially saying, we will simply pass through. We won't take anything. We will just pass along the road, the king's highway. But the Edomites would not let them. And Edom said unto him, thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away. From him. The Lord would not have them to fight the Edomites because that was not to be part of their land, their inheritance. So they had to go round about. And we read that uh, verse 4 in, in chapter 21 and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And you can look on the maps that show their journeys. They had to uh, essentially uh, turn right and go. Uh, and instead of uh, going straight through Edom, they had to go down away from the promised land, down the valley leading to the top of the Red Sea, the Gulf, the part, the Gulf of Aqaba, the, the right hand uh, of the two forks that are at the top of the Red Sea. 
And people tell us that, as the scriptures say, uh, it was a hard place. The people, the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. It was relatively flat, I think, but full of rocks. Obviously, very a desert land and difficult and hard for the people to journey along that way. And obviously discouraging to be uh, going the opposite way to the way that they wanted to go. Um, and so they complain. They are grieved at it and they complain against the Lord and against Moses. Verse 5. And the people spake against God. And against Moses, wherefore or why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. They go back to the ways that, by and large, it was their fathers, because this is a new generation. Most of, nearly all of the previous generation have died in the wilderness. Now this is a new generation, but they are repeating in danger of repeating the same sins that their fathers did and blaming the Lord and blaming Moses. Why have you brought us up to die in this wilderness? And uh, unbelief rearing its ugly head amongst them. That would ultimately, if allowed to uh, continue, would be fatal. They would again not enter the promised land. Uh, they would be there uh, and uh, Moses could not lead them into the promised land. Uh, and in many ways, I'd like to take it, and I, I don't think I'm stretching it too much. Uh, I think it is a picture in one sense uh, of mankind. Uh, in the world, uh, for all men in the world. Uh, whose fault was it that they were having to take this route? Was it the Lord's fault? Was it Moses' fault? No, it was the Edomites' fault. And before that, it was their father's fault because their fathers had, uh, had rejected the promise of God and were unwilling to, to take God at his word and enter the promised land. And so they had wandered for the 40 years. Uh, and they were now where they were because of their father's sin initially, and then also the people of Edom, the uh, unkindness uh, of the Edomites. And in one sense, I think a, a picture of mankind uh, that we are in uh, a sorrowful state. We are the world and men. We are in a sorrowful state. Uh, life can and is hard for many uh, because we are sinners by nature. We are under the curse of God and we face many sorrows. But we cannot blame the Lord. We cannot blame God as many people do. Uh, it is not God's fault that our first father, Adam, sinned and broke, uh, broke God's law, broke God's command not to eat of the fruit of the tree. Uh, it, was, uh, it was his fault, not the Lord's, and that has brought sorrow uh, upon all his descendants. Uh, and in many ways, often, uh, sorrow in the world is due to men. Uh, not just Adam's sin, but to the active uh, wickedness of men. Uh, spoke to a few uh, young ladies, I think, from Bath College on Friday, and uh, asked them, do you believe in God? No. Why not? Well, the, the usual thing now, well, uh, there's so much wickedness in the world, so much evil in the world. If God were there, why doesn't he do something about it? And I said to them, well, much of the wickedness and sorrow is there because men hurt other men. And uh, 
I said to them, we hurt one another, we hurt others. So uh, one of them asked the more sort of bold of them, do you hurt others? She had to admit she did. And uh, it is so that sadly, we are all fallen. We live in a fallen world and much sorrow in the world is due to the injustice or unkindness of other men as the, uh, as the Israelites suffered because of the Edomites and kindness. So we suffer not just from the general sorrow of, of human life, but from the unkindness uh, and injustice of others, but we cannot blame the Lord. We cannot uh, shake our fist at God and we cannot say, I'm not going to believe in the Lord because there is so much wickedness in the world because it is not the Lord's doing that there is that sorrow and wickedness in the world. And uh, the Israelites, in that sense, I believe, are a picture uh, of all mankind and our natural reaction is to complain against the Lord and to shake our fist at him for many that is what they do it's not to say Moses does not say in any way uh, they had an easy time he, he, he says it was a hard way they were discouraged because of the way and it was a hard way and I'm not saying by any means that life is always easy or pleasant for people. Uh, sorrows come and will inevitably come in one sense. I read uh, just of a, a young couple, well, about 30, I think. Um, the husband discovered three days before they were to get married that he had incurable cancer. And these things do sadly happen, not mercifully for many but for some and there are sorrows attendant upon life as a whole uh, for men in this world uh, but the worst thing we can do is to shake our fist at the Lord uh, and harden our hearts against God and say no I am not going to seek him I'm not going to trust him and the Lord uh, in one sense, uh, graciously, though obviously painfully, graciously seeks to wake the people up. They complain there is no bread, that they had manna, continuing with them day by day. Neither is there any water, which I don't believe was true. And our soul loatheth this light bread. They are greatly grieved. But the Lord will not in one sense, humor them. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. The Lord sent fiery serpents. I think generally the commentators think that means they were fiery serpents because of the pain from their poison that they bit and it was like a fire in the people's bones, but uh, uh, they may have been fiery in terms of what they looked like, but they were certainly very poisonous. And many of them uh, came and many of them bit the people and many of the people died. And uh, you can reason with me, argue with me if you want, but I would like to make this application that we men complain and are grieved at our lot in this world, but often uh, men go on in their sin and in their unbelief and the Lord lets them go on and the Lord leaves them to greater sin and to greater folly, which ultimately will be to a greater hurt. Now, one could apply it in all manner of ways, but uh, simple way uh, men will seek to drown their sorrows in alcohol but ultimately many will become ensnared with alcohol uh, and it will be a great uh, snare and a sorrow to them uh, because they become in a measure addicted certainly it will hurt them in terms of health 
but it may blight their lives. Uh, and I saw something, a lady, a man, a BBC presenter who drinks a great deal and sort of trying to uh, consider this and come to his senses, interviewing uh, a lady who was living in a caravan now, who had been uh, uh, simply an ordinary lady, a mum, a working mum, but had uh, started drinking in an ordinary way, uh, but I think had lost her house and seemingly uh, lost her marriage. All these things can result in much greater sorrow to us. Uh, in one sense, what Paul, I believe, says uh, in Romans 1, that men, because of their unbelief and their atheism and their idolatry, the Lord gives them over uh, to things that are, are worse. And uh, uh, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. And then verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And in one sense, we see it in our generation, a very unbelieving generation uh, and such things being plain. And one fears for young people, particularly with transgenderism, that uh, they, in their unbelief, go down these, are allowed to go down these routes to their ultimate sorrow, that they change their bodies, they essentially make themselves unable to have, have children later on, and a great pain to them when they come to their senses and see what they have done. But the Lord, in one sense, lets these things as a punishment. And in one sense, that some would awaken, be awakened and see their folly and uh, turn back to the Lord. Uh, but uh, there are, there is a, a, one of the chapters in uh, Revelation speaks uh, of the angel of the bottomless pit. Well, this army of locusts that will come out and bite the people and they have stings in their tails that are very painful but it is led by the devil and in one sense men in their unbelief turn away from the Lord and bring greater judgments upon themselves but uh, the wonderful message of the gospel is that the Lord is still merciful and still gracious and they come to their senses verse 7 therefore the people came to Moses and said we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us and Moses prayed for the people very rightly uh, and in one sense, in the purpose of God, they see their folly. They simply come and confess their sin uh, to the Lord what, through Moses and ask Moses to pray. And Mo the Lord could have just taken them away. But the Lord gives Moses a particular way that they are to be saved. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. The Lord would have them to have a way, uh, the, the easiest of ways, the simplest of ways. But each individual must, uh, as it were, look to that serpent. They could look at any point in the camp. If they were bitten, they didn't need to run. They didn't need to be taken. All they had to do was look and they would be made better. 
And the Lord obviously gives it as a gracious antidote for them, but as a very simple and as a very plain type or picture uh, of what the Lord Jesus would do, that we might understand that simply by faith in him, by looking to him uh, as the one crucified for us, for sinners, we shall be made uh, whole. Uh, in one sense, it could not be more plain, as the Lord says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the, the, the serpent is a, a very simple picture. Uh, I think if I may explain it uh, in two ways. Firstly, the serpent was a cursed creature, was it not? Cursed by the Lord in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and Christ has come to redeem us from the curse, but he had to be uh, hung upon a tree to be, as it were, cursed in our place. He had to bear the crown of thorns, another sign of the curse, that he was bearing that ancient curse uh, given, put upon Adam and Eve. And uh, Galatians, very precious, first Galatians 3, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, uh, that we might be saved, not from obedience to the law, but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. He was to be made a curse, and as it were, the serpent, the cursed creature, put upon the, uh, uh, put, raised up so that men could look to it to be saved. And similarly, same really, but put in a different way, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 21, uh, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The serpent, the one who caused mankind to sin by his uh, deceit and cunning, the devil, uh, and the serpents here, the punishment for their sin, the Lord Jesus Christ made sin for us to bear our sorrows, to bear that punishment for sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, that by merely looking to him, our sin is taken away and we are declared righteous and made righteous in him. Uh, and the serpent is such a wonderful and a simple picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, bearing that suffering, that punishment for sin upon the cross, being lifted up uh, upon the cross to, so that we would know that he has been cursed for us, been made sin for us, that we can be set free and we can be made whole again. Uh, and the very simple uh, picture again, that whosoever, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. It came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. That all they had to do was look to the serpent. All men have to do now is to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they shall be made whole. It was the only way. There was no other antidote. They could not run to Moses and say, give us some potion, some medicine. He had nothing. All they could do was look to the serpent of brass. All they had to do was look. Uh, and it is the same for sinners today and in every age, that all we are to do 
is to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way, no other one to whom we may look, no other antidote for sin, uh, for the effects and the curse of sin, uh, but a wonderful and effectual uh, and very glorious and gracious way of forgiveness and way of pardon and way of setting free from sin. Again, one tries to explain to people when they say, I'm not going to believe in God because there is so much wickedness in the world. Try and say, well, the Lord has given us the antidote, has given us the means uh, of cleansing people's hearts, of turning them from sin and unkindness and cruelty and injustice. But men will not turn and men will not believe and will not uh, uh, find forgiveness and a changed heart. But the Lord is speaking to Nicodemus all about the new birth, which is what we all need. Uh, and he sets before him the way that we may receive the new birth by faith in the crucified Savior, the one who would be lifted up. We all must look. None, uh, there are no exceptions. I've listened to a few testimonies of uh, uh, old, retired pastors, had a faithful ministry, uh, and it's interesting to hear a number of them, uh, the sons of pastors themselves, but they had no easy way. They had to come to the foot of, of Christ, to the cross, to confess their sin in the same way as the people had to do. We have sinned. Uh, and to, to look to him for mercy and forgiveness. One uh, elderly brother, he said he was a member of the church. I don't quite know how he'd become a member. He was a member of the church, obviously accepted by many uh, as a genuine Christian. But he said his father, who was the pastor, uh, realized that he wasn't. And uh, uh, he... It, I, I, it came about in this way that he, uh, there was a prayer meeting on the, the Saturday evening uh, and he had been uh, uh, doing an athletics meeting, I think, uh, on the Saturday afternoon. He was still at school and, and quite a capable athlete uh, in Wales uh, and he had not gone to the prayer meeting. I think there were other reasons as well. But he said his father shortly after that uh, preached on... Uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira from Acts 5 uh, and speaking of their hypocrisy and saying there are uh, those or one in the church, those in the church who uh, prefer athletics to the prayer meeting. <laughs> and uh, he said the son said he was very angry with his father, but uh, came to see what he said was true. That he wasn't truly a believer. And he said a few, I don't know, days, weeks, a little while later came to the Lord, confessed his sin, put his trust in the Saviour and never looked back. But all, oh, we all, that is the only way we can be saved. It is the simplest, most wonderful, uh, most effective way, no other way uh, that takes away sin if we may look to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And uh, may he help us, may our trust ever be in him and may we never be dis discouraged but ever look to him in all our difficulties in all our uh, needs uh, whenever we are convicted of our sin and know that he will save and he will help Amen. Our last hymn is number 487, there is life for a look at the crucified one. <laughs>